This is The Lockpicking Lawyer, and the video you're about to watch is the culmination of a series of events that started about six months ago. That's when Shane, at the excellent YouTube channel Stuff Made Here, posted a video build of an unpickable lock. That video, which I will link below, also challenged me to open it. I obviously accepted because the lock is here, but Shane wanted to improve his design first. And by improve, he seems to have meant completely redesigned from the ground up, because what I received was the original lock and a second lock which bore no internal resemblance to the first. And I have to say I had a great time with these, because both mechanisms are, to the best of my knowledge, completely original and in my opinion quite good. Fortunately for me though, Shane doesn't have a lot of experience with lock defeat methods, so there were a few minor oversights that I was able to exploit. However, each of the issues I found can be fixed with very little effort, which would result in formidable lock designs. Before we pick these, I want to explain what I'm going to do so my actions don't look too cryptic. That will require some reference to the internals, but if you want a detailed look at what's inside, you need to check out the Stuff Made Here YouTube channel, and all the appropriate links are below. The first lock, this one, looks something like this on the inside. When you insert the key, the pins in contact with the key will lift these upper pins that are shown in gold. Those pins then lock into place and rotate until they're in contact with this fin. There are gates in the fin, and only if these upper pins are in the correct position will they pass through. Notably, however, when that test phase occurs, when those upper pins encounter the fins, they are no longer in contact with the key pins. That's what makes this unpickable in theory. What I'm going to do is lift all of the upper pins as far as they will go, lock them in place, rotate them until they're in contact with the fin, and then drop them down until they fall into their gates. It usually takes a few attempts for it to work, but the method seems to be reliable. The second lock is even more complex than the first. It actually has two cores attached with an internal connecting rod. If we look at the back, we can see the bottom core, the top core, and a connecting rod. The shear line that matters is the one on the upper core, which we can't access to tension. It's behind this area of the lock. By the time that upper core actually turns, the bottom core is offset by about 45 degrees, which means you can't move the pins. That's why this lock is, at least in theory, unpickable. Put differently, when you can access the pins, you can't tension the lock, and when you can tension it, you can't access the pins. I'm going to try to get around that by inserting a thin piece of metal between the door and the lock housing, then slide it up until we're over the top of that upper core, and then pull down, which should tension the upper core. Once that happens, I should be able to pick this as I would a normal lock. There are two other potential vulnerabilities. The first arises from a combination of this core rotating 45 degrees in either direction until it seizes up, and the tailpiece being misclocked by about 45 degrees. When we pick, you'll see why that makes a difference, but I think you'll get a chuckle when you see how they interact. The second vulnerability is decoding, and we can do that because all of these upper driver pins are the same length. A tool can be fashioned to lift all the pin stacks to the stopping point, fully compressing the springs. That's an indirect way of measuring the key pins, which would allow us to cut a key. I did not create that tool because I had another way to open this, but that's something that used to be common before manufacturers started varying these lengths. Okay, I have been talking for too long. The jig that Shane sent me to pick these in is way too big to fit on my desk, so we are going to mount these up, head down to the garage, and try to open them. Okay, we are down in the garage. Both locks are mounted in this mock door and the frame is secured to my workbench. We're going to start with the newer of the two locks and discuss a vulnerability enabled by the fact that this core will turn about 45 degrees before it seizes. 
That creates an issue as the lock interacts with the deadbolt. Now, under normal circumstances, a deadbolt that is fully extended can't be pushed back into the door. However, if we turn this core as far as it will go, it's just enough to disengage the anti-retraction mechanism. That's something we can certainly take advantage of while the door is locked. All we need to do that is something that will turn the core and something pointy like the tip of my pocket knife. So I'm going to turn this as far as it will go, then use the point of the knife to walk the bolt back. Might as well let them know we're here. Next, we are going to attempt a picking attack, though certainly not a traditional one. We discussed it upstairs, but what I'm going to do is attempt to slip this between the door and the housing so we can tension the upper core. Pushing this in will do damage to the door. However, I don't think it'll be a lot of damage, and I don't think it'll be very noticeable because it'll be on the bottom. However, I will show you the damage after we're done. The hard part will be getting this into position, so let's do that now. I am pushing the tool against the door so it doesn't deform. Okay, I might have it, but the only way to be sure is to pull on these pliers and see if the pins are binding. There we go, click out of one, little click on two, nothing on three, little click on four, little click on five, one, two, another click on three, click on four, nothing on five. I don't feel anything else. Let's see if we have this open. Okay, now let's work on the older lock. Once again, I discussed the theory of what we're going to be doing while we were upstairs. However, it's a little bit harder in practice. First, we need to lock it. Okay, I'm going to use this pick to lift all the pins to their highest position. And when I release these, I'm going to be tapping on the housing with this mallet. It allows for a little bit more control as the pins come down, and it increases the chances of success from about one in every 10 times to one in every two or three. I think we've got it. Okay, folks, let's bring all this stuff back upstairs. I will show you the damage underneath and we will sum everything up. Okay, folks, we are back upstairs and I'm going to briefly address how to fix each of the exploits I demonstrated. But first, let's take a look at the damage to the door. It's certainly noticeable once the lock is removed, though much of the damage is covered by the lock and the part that isn't is probably obscured because it's underneath the bulky housing. Frankly, even if I saw that, I'd probably attribute it to sloppy installation and not to an attack. While we're looking at the door, note that Shane welded both of the hinge pins, probably to stop me from popping the pins and declaring victory. And I've got to say, he did the right thing because I definitely would have done that. Moving on to the locks, the issue with the first lock can be fixed easily by decreasing the angle of the fins so there's no slope for them to rest on. Frankly, a reverse rake would probably be advisable. With the second lock, the first exploit can be fixed with a slight modification to this moving tailpiece, reclocking that cutout by about 45 degrees. 
There are about a dozen ways to fix the picking exploit and deny access to the back of the lock, but when I told Shane about it, he precision machined a back cover, which is probably the most expensive solution, but certainly one that works. So I hope you all enjoyed this. Shane, excellent work on these locks, and thank you so much for sending them my way. To everyone else, that's all I have for you today. If you do have any questions or comments about this, please put them below. If you like this video and would like to see more like it, please subscribe. And as always, have a nice day. Thank you.